Hello, my name is Dove Weinblatt. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training of Metro New York. I'm thrilled to be the host of Keshet's virtual series, Join Resilience, Jewish LGBTQ Leaders on What Sustains Us. As LGBTQ Jewish people, oftentimes we need to create our own ways of persevering through tough moments. Surviving and thriving in this world has pushed us to create our own store of unique wisdom about resilience, joy, and community. Each week, our team will invite a different Jewish LGBTQ community leader to join us in a thoughtful conversation about what sustains us and keeps us hopeful. In these conversations, we can only speak from our own personal lived experiences. As we are here during Pride Month, we want to uplift the fact that pride has its origins in the bold actions of black trans women against police violence, homophobia, and transphobia. The fierce joy and celebration of the LGBTQ community has always been deeply connected with the fight for justice and survival. Today, as our country faces head on the, injustice, the injustices and dangers of black and brown folks, especially black and brown trans and queer folks, have endured for hundreds of years we feel particularly connected to the lessons of the past and how our liberation is bound together. With me today is my colleague, Emily Saltzman, who will introduce our guest. Thanks, Deb. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Deb mentioned, my name is Emily Saltzman. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training here at Keshet. We are so thrilled to have Rachel Mason join us today, and I have the honor of telling you a little bit more about her. Rachel Mason is a Los Angeles-based multimedia artist, director, and musician. Her first feature film, The Lives of Hamilton Fish, was a historical fantasy that toured internationally as a live performed concert. Mason most recently directed the Netflix original documentary, Circus of Books, executive produced by Ryan Murphy. The film details her own biographical story, growing up the child of pornographers at the center of the gay community. She also wrote and recorded the film's end credit song, Give You Everything. In 2019, Rachel Mason was featured as one of IndieWire's 25 LGBTQ filmmakers on the rise. Welcome again, Rachel. As Dove Hi. mentioned earlier, our conversation series is about joy and resilience. So tell us. What do those words mean to you and how do they intersect? Wow, those are awesome sentiments for our moment right now, as crazy as it is. I just, a few things, I think, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize we have this one precious little tiny instantaneous almost window of moment, which is our lives here on earth. And what are we going to do while we're here on earth to be in this place with these people who we have the great, incredible blessing of being here with. Um, you know, the profound mystery of life is the question of why, why are we all here? And I think that's something that, um, you know, when I think of the ultimate, you know, I think a lot of people think of this in, in you know, maybe liberal or contemporary Jewish thought, but the idea of tikkun olam, to heal the world, you know, is really this profound thing. What does that mean to you? And to me, what it means is to connect people together, to unify, to try to find the ways in which we're actually similar and not different, and to try to find the ways in which we can heal each other and, and what it means for this moment. So I think there's also a great importance of being joyful while you're doing it. And, you know, I've noticed for myself, if I'm on social media or I'm doing something, I start feeling tons of anxiety and there's no joy in this and it's really difficult and painful. You know, I think we're fighting something painful right now in our society. And I think we're fighting incredibly difficult battles, but we have to find those moments of joy in the fight. Otherwise you actually can't fight. I really think that joy is at the center of every basic thing that you can do and which is why songs come into play and in protest movement, you know, they bring, people together in a joyful way. So dance, songs, you know, the arts actually provide the joy and the uplift. So I've always been on the side of the joy and the art part of things. And I think it's really important to unify that with the actual cause of, you know, the injustice that we want to rectify in our world. I really love that you brought in this conversation around music and how music helps to fuel mm -hmm the movement or can, you know, really help us get out of a moment of 
isolation or loneliness or um, discontent or fear or anxiety as a musician like are there things that are there particular songs that have done that for you have you created songs that you feel like have up uplifted are, are the purpose to uplift others or uplift yourself or just, you know really thinking about the power of music you know, it's so interesting. I think that in, um, in like the spiritual tradition of, of Judaism, at the center of, of what brings us together is often a musical foundation. And, you know, I think of, um, well, when I was making Circus of Books, actually, one of the things that brought me the greatest joy was at the end of the film, I, I was able to put in my song that I wrote, which was, it's called Give You Everything. And it was my vision for the store, if the store had a soul, what it would be saying. And, you know, one of the lyrics that I wrote was, let me celebrate what you don't understand. And I remember thinking, you know, in some ways, like music and the song, and it was like moving ahead of time. In the, in the music behind Circus of Books, um, I was really drawn to pulling from the archives of gay dance music, which actually has its roots in gay porn and the music of gay clubs, which were these sort of special holy places where, you know, gay people came together to dance. And if you think about what gay culture is, foundationally, it was like a safe place for people that did not belong in society and they didn't have a place to go. So in some ways, when I was thinking about, you know, um, just that one song and piecing it together as part of the film, um, you know, in, in a strange way, it does connect to Jewish culture because we have this tie to the music that really binds us all together. Um, you know, I, I hear songs and I'm always like, wow, that's, that's this Jewish song that I know. It's like a little earworm in the back of my head. And, you know, um, I feel a relationship to Judaism in some ways through the music. And in, in some ways, I feel that very strong pull of my identity through of gay culture through the dance music because I just have so many positive memories of this beautiful sort of soundtrack built into a culture that was celebrating itself even when nobody else was celebrating it. Awesome, yeah, that resonates with me too. Thanks for bringing that in. Yeah, I was thinking um, for, uh, for the majority of my growing up, I felt I was really, involved in my Jewish communities, but also felt a really big disconnect because of holding queer identities and not seeing myself reflected in tradition or people in my community. Mm. And I attended um, a Pride Shabbat um, at Princeton. I was their mm. like Hillel's keynote speaker last year. And mm. I was kind of, again, lovingly against my will pulled into like the reform service. Mm. Um, and it, it was built on Debbie Friedman's music and her mm. prayers and I didn't know that she was a lesbian and I didn't know that mm. the majority of the songs that I grew up with and loved were hers and were her melodies mm. and were her uh, was and so that kind of like being in that space I felt so connected to these strangers wow through Judaism and through this music that was like I, this is going to sound kind of like extreme, but it felt life changing. It felt really mm. important and it really helped me like reconnect with my Jewish identity that I had felt such a disconnect with for so long. So I'm so glad that you brought in that whole like the idea of music and um, wow, how it connects. I didn't, I didn't know she was a lesbian either until you just said it right now. It's yeah. So you know, and I think that's a fascinating thing that we're just maybe discovering now who like the old elders who were gay Jews were because you look back at the elders and nobody was out really, you know, because you couldn't necessarily be, or maybe some of them were, but in a very discreet kind of a way. And it's very profound, I think, for, you know, younger generations to um, identify those elders and say, wow, that person actually was a gay Jew because those things, you know, as you see in my film, there was a schism. You couldn't necessarily wed the two. And, um, I feel one of the most profound things just for me is knowing that there's such a giant pride celebration in Israel. I was unaware of how big Israel's pride um, celebration was. And I was really shocked to find out because in some ways I, I had that disconnect for myself too, that Jewish culture is here, gay culture is here and never the two shall meet. And 
Um, and, and I also, you know, am aware of, um, there's a synagogue in LA called Kol Ami, um, and, and there are synagogues in, that have, you know, strong foundational Jewish leaders. And I go to a synagogue here in LA that has a, uh, a lesbian rabbi. And it's so profound because it was the opposite of how I was raised. And I, like you, I don't know if you were raised conservative or reform or any of them, but I was raised conservative. And it was incredibly patriarchal. There was just not even a chance there would be a female rabbi, let alone a gay rabbi, you know. Um, and, you know, it was something I just rebelled against flat out was the, the um, very powerful schism between men and women's roles that felt very, um, you know, male dominated in the worst possible way. Yeah. Have you, have you found, like, though you felt that schism in your, well, I guess you have because you, you go to, you go to a synagogue and so you found your, you've kind of found your way back to Judaism in a, in a way that makes sense for you. I'm, I'm wondering if you can share with us, like, was there a moment or what kind of um, inspired you to pursue Judaism, even though there was that schism? Well, I, I would say for many, many, many years after high school, when I left, I, I just rejected Judaism altogether. And I really didn't even have many Jewish friends because my Jewish experience in LA was I went to um, a very conservative synagogue and I it was in Beverly Hills. And you know, part of the culture of Beverly Hills, I was very turned off by, and it was very materialistic. And I had an association with Jewish culture and the materialism of, you know, Beverly Hills in the 1980s. And I just thought, okay, I don't really have anything to do with these people. They're really not my people. And yet, of course, I'm profoundly attached to being Jewish. I, you can't not ever be Jewish once you're Jewish. And, you know, I, I've had my experiences of anti-Semitism, you know, and so many times I would feel um, like defending Judaism in the face of blatant anti-Semitism. And at the same time, I don't have much to say for, well, what am I doing to really be Jewish in my life? And, you know, when I don't really connect to Judaism. And so I, I think it was maybe 10 years or so after really not hardly doing anything um, Jewish when I was, uh, you know, my mom would always call me every single high holiday and say, are you in synagogue? And, you know, of course I would either come up with some excuse or just feel really guilty on that day. Um, which was basically my Jewish experience, but I had a longing for, you know, the, the, the traditions. And I think that's one of the things that is so baked in that, you know, it's, there's a tradition, you know, the, the Yiddish saw, you know, the tradition, tradition, I think, you know, the Fiddler on the Roof really does hit upon it. You, you, you have a kind of almost like a deep seated, you know, desire to, to have a, if you have some positive memories of those traditions, which I, have always had like Shabbat and Passover. Like, how can I get to that in a way that isn't, you know, offensive to my values? And so I was in New York and I had graduated Yale and this um, really cool professor and teacher and writer that I adored named Rhonda Lieberman invited me. I remember she called me up one day and she was like, hey, you know, do you want to go to, um, Yom Kippur services. And I remember thinking like, what? You're so cool. Why would you be going to Yom Kippur services? And she was like, no, I know this really great drag queen who holds these awesome services, you know? And I was like, wow, okay. I definitely want to go to that because if a drag queen is conducting a service, it's going to be awesome. And Rhonda Lieberman is saying, so we better go. And so it was really eye opening to attend synagogue with somebody that dragged me in from a place that was like, cool, you know, wow, okay, I trust your judgment here. And then secondly, to have this profound, beautiful service that was conducted by, I think his name was Amichai. He's a pretty well-known, like, queer Jewish um, leader. And he was just so beautiful. I was mesmerized by this sort of different kind of experience. And, you know, it led me to seek out other different kinds of experiences. And I was reminded of um, a sort of jubu uh, service that I had been to many years ago with my mom and a, her friend in LA, a guy named Jonathan Omerman, a rabbi who, um, who basically sort of wedded some principles of Jewish philosophy with Buddhist philosophy. And it was also, again, one of the few times I felt like, okay, 
I can find something for myself in this that um, is not at odds with my heart, you know? And um, so, so it's been these really, I think pretty radical people who themselves tried to change Judaism, which led me back into it. And so I've found those people. And here in LA, there's a uh, Rabbi Josie Hudson, who's the leader of Temple Israel. And I, I just love her a lot. And she's, um, she's a out queer leader of a major synagogue in LA. And um, I just, I really like her approach. So. That's really, I love that. And Amichai is, um, I just in, in, interviewed Amichai a few weeks ago. Oh, cool. For the same series. Um, and he does really cool stuff with Lab Shul here in New York. Wow. Um, so, uh, yeah, but that's what I think we went to maybe. It was okay. like something like that. Yeah, it was so great. No, and it was completely revolutionary for me because I basically had just, um, you know, I, I figured if I was going to do anything Jewish, I would just sort of hold my nose and do it. But this was like, no, I can actually dive in and feel it. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful to just like have that moment of, oh, I get to have this again, or I get to have this in a way that feels way more connected to the way I see the world now. And, yeah. you know, when you were sharing before that, you know, this just, I, the people in this particular community are just, doesn't quite jive with where, where I am. And I experienced that too. I didn't know there was any other kind until I founded social justice, Jewish community. You know, mm. it just changed the way I saw being Jewish and that you can have both of those things together. So I, that really resonates with me also. That's really I'm, awesome. I'm wondering, yeah, oh, go sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's awesome. Oh, great. Thanks for the affirmation. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm wondering if we could ask you a little bit about circus and books. Yeah, of course. Totally. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about why, what inspired you to make the film? Well, in a funny way, the store was always just part of my life, like a, like a cousin or something, or maybe even like an uncle. I, I loved the store. I, I, it was, it was a part of my like upbringing and a part of, you know, a special place that I just loved and I knew was always there. And, you know, um, a number of different things led me to want to make a documentary about it over the years. And then when 2014 came around and my mom really was saying, no, we're closing the store. I remember feeling like, wow, that's, that feels like an actual, like a death in the family or something like, wow, if I don't go and, you know, conduct an interview with this really important person, they'll die before I ever get the chance. And it really like lit the fire that I had to come in, back to LA and I was living in New York at the time. So I came back to LA and I didn't realize that it was going to take so long. <laughs> I didn't also realize that you know, it was going to be so large and impactful. I thought it would be a small, a really small documentary for, you know, primarily gay men who might love the store as much as I did. I mean, I thought it was going to be a very niche audience that enjoyed this film. And then as I really dove in hard to work on it and had a great editor and worked with a bunch of really amazing producers, the story itself got bigger and it became more about my family. It became more about my mom and the journey to make the film really expanded it into a much bigger, broader story. And I would have never believed that this whole film would end up dialoguing with the Jewish community and it would end up being a film that, you know, reached so many people um, and had, you know, was able to be on Netflix and hundreds of countries. I, just thought it was going to be a really tiny niche project that a handful of people would care about. So yeah, what led me to make the film was really just that the store was closing. Well, I loved it. I thought it was really, really powerful film. And, you know, I, I love watching films that talk about community and place mm -hmm. and what it sounded like you really did with, talk about the incredible meaning and the space that Circus of Books came about and, and provided for the gay community in LA and how so incredibly different things are. Like physical place has changed so much for our community 
that as queer people and trans people that we are existing in a different time where we can connect virtually, we can connect um, in all these different platforms that the physical space isn't as important, but it is so important in other ways that like historically having a physical space to find other people like you was about survival to like know that you weren't the only one. I mean, I love the section where you're talking about um, the, the magazine one, like the meaning mm. behind, like you're not the only one. And that, that, mm. that magazine was, was shelved at the store to really focus on we can find each other because they're yeah. the means to find each other just was, was slim at that time. Right. And yeah. No, I and think that's so sad and knowing that yeah. like we don't have the same things anymore. We don't have the physical place. Like I really am lamenting, you know, there's like queer dance parties. There's all these things that like happen on a rotation, but if you don't know when they happen, how like, could you get there or that there's not, there's less places that have the mainstay. There are less places that are physical that you could go to. Right. Well, and you're hitting on another thing that I really cared about when I wanted, when I set out to make this film, one of the things that actually was my biggest um, really reason to make the film was that I understood something that I didn't see many people outside of this little tiny world I was in of mostly gay men understanding, which was simply that gay erotic content was actually a lifeline. When you talk about gay porn or when people talk about porn, you know, it's got this sort of like shadow of sin hanging over it. And everybody has this, you know, really like, ah, what are we about to say? You know, the P word just creates a cringe value for many, many, many people. But when I would speak to gay men and, you know, I know this is definitely the case for gay women too, but I just was, you know, because of the store, the primary audience was gay men they would get literally tears in their eyes. And I mean, actually tears would stream down their face even when they would talk about what it meant to see two people in a romantic or sexual situation when the entire history of our culture denied that foundational image to exist. That homosexuality is so separate from something that you could visualize, that to walk into a store where the visualization of it was the center of the store. I mean, I, I, I met people and they really were of an older generation who would break down and cry because they would say, you know, I actually lived in a state of constant shame and degradation. And to see, that's why the man who says to see two men naked and unafraid, that gave us a lot of pride. You know, that one line, was so powerful. And, and my friend, Billy Miller, when he said, you know, Rachel, to be a homosexual was unspeakable. You know, I mean, those are words like unspeakable. That is actually what it was. And so you would, you know, go into a store like this and see the unthinkable and the unspeakable, and you would have this moment of recognition for yourself. And yet what I found to be so profound about it was that it was tied into this thing that we totally shame as a culture, which is porn. And you know, I've, over the course of doing these interviews, I've had another sort of element in my life, which is that my actual partner is an ex-gay porn star himself, and he's actually a, a foundational person in the trans community. His name's Buck Angel, and he had the same thing for the trans experience. He literally said he made his porn because he didn't get to see it. It was no person in the entire world that looked like him, and to make that porn, it wasn't to do this seedy shady thing. It was a form of activism. It was an actual gift to a group of people. And so I set out to make this film to highlight that and to make that point, you know, totally separate from my mom and her values and all of this stuff. You know, I had actually thought that the center of my film would be basically that. And, um, you know, the fact that it ended up getting to have a few additional layers to it really was exciting to me. And, you know, maybe is the reason why I was able to tell the story in the way that I did, because it gives it the humanity that you can see behind. But ultimately, I, I have this feeling that people who work in this industry, sex workers and porn workers, are really vilified. And what they are doing 
is a form of therapy. And that's what I see. I, I don't see a difference between that work and therapy. You know, people are sexual beings. And mm -hmm. if we deny that, we just simply deny that, you know, people eat and people mm -hmm. sleep. There's certain things we just have to recognize, you know, the reason we are all here is, you know, actually right. related to sex. So I am fascinated that we condemn this thing so much first off. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that we can't resolve the fact simply that there's a variety of different kinds of sexual behavior, you know, and that, you know, there's this type of very strict type of sexual behavior that's sanctioned and everything else is not. So I've found that the people who did the work in pornography to open people's minds, people like Buck, you know, is very few mm -hmm. radical people like that who had the, um, really, I would say the kind of amazing forth foresight to, mm -hmm. to step foot in that territory. That was why I wanted to make this film to give homage to the, the gay people in that mm -hmm. industry, especially who many lost their lives. Yeah. Well, first off, please thank Buck. I mean, like what a celebrity and incredible um, work that he did revolution, revolutionizing like porn industry. I'm a sex educator also. So like, oh, you are very, oh, cool. yeah. So very exciting. So thank you. Please send. No, I will tell <laughs> him you. that you, you know, um, it does mean a lot to him to hear that because he is mm -hmm. still to this day attacked by people that just simply think, oh, it's ho horrible and disgusting. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the, that's part of the sandwich you get to eat when you work in this industry. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And exactly. especially being queer and trans mm -hmm. and everything else. So mm -hmm. thank you for appreciating his work. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. totally. Well, and also something that you're saying, just this conversation around visibility and how visibility is just life changing. Yeah. And, you know, we even, I'm, I'm also a social worker, so I got a lot of stuff going on. But my, my colleagues who, like, work with youth and specifically, like, trans youth, there's a lot of, this is, this has changed a little bit since, but, you know, 10 years ago when we were first starting in the field and working with trans young people and there wasn't a lot of visibility to showcase love in the trans mm. community, to showcase like real wow. story arcs in media. And so porn was the place. And so there was a lot of conversations about how do we make sure that we help, help young people find supportive porn that is empowering and wow. feminist and queer and also that um, to, to make sure that they have the avenues to find that so they can see themselves reflected because mm -hmm. if wow. you don't yeah. then you you have a hard time seeing yourself as lovable seeing yourself as desired and cared for um, so totally. it has changed a little bit but you know it porn was a big part of conversations that were had at that time and, and was buck's work recommended to people you know i don't recall like specific oh okay conversations yeah. but it was it was more about like um here are some search concepts. terms yeah. like here are some concepts and like yeah. teens are finding it on their own so like how do we make sure that we we give them um helpful guidance to get there you know, well, and, and because yeah. Buck was part of feminist porn, you know, like it's easier totally. to find him, but. Oh yeah. yeah. He's in that book called feminist porn. Do you know there's I a got book? it on my shelf. Oh, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, I think that's also part of the thing. I was just talking to the class uh, that Candace teaches um, who she edited that book and Candace, um, she said to me, you know, I made the book called Feminist Porn because feminists would always say to me, well, how can you support mm -hmm. porn and call That's yourself right. a feminist? You know, and I have been on that side as somebody who actually like, basically my, my sort of feeling was like, I'm an advocate for gay porn. And I would always say, well, you know, I don't really have anything to say about straight porn and I don't really think about it very much, but in an interesting way, I've gotten a glimpse into it because just through proximity of Buck and the people he knows, and I've had a different kind of view of it as well. And, and actually more the women in it and many of whom are, are empowered, very thoughtful. They know what they're doing They're you know, and I recognize something that women who are in porn do that is a very powerful thing, which is 
you know, just now when I was um, speaking to somebody recently about a famous porn star, one of the most powerful things a woman can ever say is that she has sexual desires. You know, women are cut off from that in any way. And if you say that you are a sexual being, you're, you know, historically that was like an absolute taboo. You know, you're vilified, you're a whore. And, you know, that's the ultimate anti-female position is to be a whore and a slut. And so the women that would embrace their sexual being would, you know, really fly in the face of this cultural taboo. And I have to say, I felt a sense of like, you know, real admiration for their bravery because it takes a lot of guts to know that you're going to do this thing that will, you know, similar to being queer, you know, it takes a lot of guts to simply say I'm queer and to be in this world. And so I think, I think there's a, a place for, um, you know, of course we have to respect the people that do this work. But I was always a, on the other side where I, I didn't want to say anything at all about straight porn because I just don't feel any connection to it. And yet um, that has Same. come to change a little. <laughs> but yeah, no, I feel like basically gay porn has been activism and therapy for a community that needed it. But I also think straight porn is a, a therapy as well. And also modeling consent. I think yeah. it's in gay porn and, and queer porn. Um, they, they, that conversation is just not as visible in, in mainstream, mainstream porn, but, um, yeah. anyway, well, I could talk about we, this. We could, yeah, we could go into that conversation you know? <laughs> if you want to pull back and talk about Jewish stuff, about Jewish porn. <laughs> let's get Jewier. Let's go. Dove, um, do you have a question? Um, yeah, but it's not Jewish related. We could, we could, make, it, we could make it Jewish. No, no, it's definitely Jewish related. Um, I just, I wanted to, um, to know from you, like, how you, if and how you view art as a form of resilience, and, hmm. and if so, like, what would that, what does that look like for you, and do you have examples of, because you're a multimedia artist, and like, what that looks like for you. I know we kind of talked about it with song earlier, but yeah, I want to dig into that a little bit more. Well, I mean, my favorite artist in all time and space and history is Frida Kahlo. And if you look at her work, you know, I think she was an early gender warrior. I think she was doing something that was so profound because she truly healed her physical pain through her art. And she also presented herself, you know, fully frontal in this way that was really direct. And I, I have to say, you know, artists like that, um, somehow have this ability to leap out of history and, and become so impactful. And I, I just always have, um, you know, in some ways, I think Frida Kahlo was the first artist I ever um, encountered where I was like, wow, I think this is like, she is like my, I'm baked in my DNA somehow. I'm connected to this, you know, sense of, you know, speaking of therapy, like the, the healing value in, in making art, you feel it in her work. She's like processing so much stuff on a psychic level, on a subconscious level. And, you know, I always try to make, when I'm in the art space, I really try to just tap into what is somehow buried in my soul. And it's not always beautiful. And it's also not always um, friendly and easy for me to digest as well. And sometimes, um, you know, my work before Circus of Books was very artistic and often very political. So I would see something that would just really infuriate me and I would be driven to create a performance piece or do something. Um, and, and I think that artists really um, are almost like the shamans of our moment. And for myself personally, I've become, you know, I've shifted my artistic, uh, I guess, creative brain into a space where I feel most able to do the best amount of work, you know, in the healing form, which is through films and, and, and the moving image and media. And I love the new territory in media, which is open to people like me and open to different voices, which I didn't see, you know, in the, in the indie space, there was always a kind of art house, you know, niche film th theater that I, those, those were where I was, would hang out. But now I see it, you know, the Jill Soloways of the world, you know, the Ryan Murphys of the world, the Ava DuVernay's who are truly making content that says, hey guys, listen to this story right here. This person's story is really amazing. These people never had a voice. And now I want you to, you know, take a look at this culture that came and went. And so I feel some, some sense that I'm a part of a legacy 
of um, almost being like a historian to mine a certain territory. And so I am really in love with that space that I'm in right now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my personal sense of um, what artistic means. Yeah. Yeah, and I think too, like, um, like you were saying, it's not always like pretty inside, but it's, it's like something is like calling you to make art with it. And I think that there's, and then what happens when you do that is that other people are going to see mm. those parts of themselves in that artwork. And then maybe it becomes a little less scary or a little less not so pretty. Yeah. And I think, and then to like kind of expand it a little bit more, it's like bringing it back to Emily's point around visibility and being able to see yourself in other people's art is also a form of resilience because it, it helps, helps you feel not alone. And it helps you like one, not you know, feel not alone. And I was thinking too, as I asked you a not Jewish question, I had this like, here's what happened. I had this like flood of guilt that I was like, why aren't we making this more Jewish? And then the fact that the three of us are talking about porn and visibility, mm. and we're Jewish is Jewish and is really- yeah. That we're even just just us having this casual conversation is really important because I don't well, think a lot of Jewish yeah people no I think a lot of Jewish people are very much on the side of sex shaming and and yet if you look at people who are very much on the forefront of the sex industry in terms of um, you know writers thinkers and also producers in the industry there's a lot of Jews here I mean it's a very Jewish industry it's so interesting and. And so there's a question about why that is, you know, are, is, are Jews more open-minded on one hand, even as we have all this shame and judgment on the other. And, you know, I, I've gotten emails from people who've seen, seen my film. Some have not been Jewish, but the majority have whose parents were also, or family members were also in the industry. And they would say things like, oh, you know, I'm so glad you made this film. It felt like I was right there in my uncle's garage. You know, I remember he was, you know, dealing porn and nobody would talk about it. And it was kind of like the dirt, dirt, dirty, dark secret of our family. And I, you know, I have the thought of like, well, why is it such a dark, dirty secret? And why is it something that we judge in this way? And, you know, and even in my own family, it actually has been and had been that for a very long time. Um, you know, my mom was harshly judged by many members of her own family. And it wasn't like, there's not that judgment in my family. There is you know, um, and I, I look at that and I think, well, is that a Jewish thing or is it more of a cultural thing in general? Is it, you know, our society beginning to change as well? And I, I do think there's a generational shift. I think that a younger generation has grown up with the kind of access to it that the older generation didn't have, you know, and I think when you have you know, access to it on Instagram and YouTube, you're basically, it's right there. So, you know, the older generation, it was really, you had to seek it out. You had to make an effort. You had to go into an actual store. And, you know, I think that layer of extra effort that was required meant if you walked into that store, you could feel like a huge pervert, you know, as opposed to, oh, well, it's on my phone. I'll just, you know, look at some stuff real quick, you know, um, I think that's changed our culture. And I think actually the type of tons of communication that we have on Instagram, you know, probably one in every five people has had some type of conversation about porn on Instagram or on a YouTube channel or somewhere. Like it's just, it is a part of our dialogue. And I think that um, generationally we are going to see a shift where it might not be so shamed. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm being very pos positive and also very western you know la based in my thinking and you know i should recognize that the rest of the world is not as uh in that same headspace maybe i think in new york we're there with you <laughs> like, i know at least maybe the coast we are in bubbles it's important to remember that and yeah. you know even in in these little moments right now you know there's a lot of angry messaging on online and i i, I see it even i'm i'm in the sea of the most liberal elite who are you know on the fringe of the far left even and the infighting you know within like the most fringe elite of the queerest of the queer you know communities 
people are just taking each other apart, picking apart their language, picking apart this and that. And I, I have moments when I just have to say, okay, can we just keep an eye on the giant prize, which is actually there's a world out there that really wants to see us all burn in hell and be destroyed. And um, let's just stop, you know, correcting each other in this really like Stasi like kind of a way. Um, because I do see it in the queer space and the, you know, in the um, allyship space, in the space of people trying to, you know, support and love each other and support and love the, the black community if you're not black. And, you know, if you're trying to say something and you don't say it right, you know, is that, is that an unforgivable offense and you are now forever brandished in this way? You know, these, it's very, um, it's very hostile right now on the left. And I just think that we need to settle down our hostility just we are extremely hostile to each other on the left so i feel like you know in some strange way jews are in this weird space where we've been totally annihilated on the one hand by white people we know actually burned into our dna the feeling of that deep dark pain and yet here in america we're white we're part of the problem in some ways just simply because of how we may you know, physically look white. And um, I just think there's this sort of strange moment we're all in where we're collectively freaking out. And, and um, you know, so it is nice to have conversations that center around Jewish and queer ideas. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, what you're speaking to this, um, this idea of like not being queer enough, not being radical enough, not being mm -hmm. Jewish enough, like this this continuous competition and also knowing that we're all doing our best we're all on our journey and as dubs mentioned at the beginning of our talk today you know that all of our liberation is tied together that the idea of separating us is part of like the systemic racism and and white mm. supremacy that like pulling us apart is part exactly. of how the system works mm -hmm. so you know we all have more to learn we all have mistakes to make and we all have accountability to be working towards and so you know we're we're doing we're doing what we can with this time and we all have more more to do so yeah the journey no, and I would love to just see us come together more rather than separate more because I think, you know, I will say I see in um, in Buck's Instagram and Twitter feeds. <laughs> I mean, it's I, I mentioned to people sometimes like, wow, you can't believe the most extreme hostility I've ever seen in my entire life is within the trans community. And I was telling my brother about that and he was like, what? But Buck is trans. How would anyone ever within that community, like their 0.06% of the population be, you know, anti, you know, you know, he gets death threats from people within that community. And I'm like, I look at this and I'm like, wow, if ever there was a way to obliterate an already marginalized group of people, it's like, let's find a way to just destroy and destroy and destroy. And you can kind of see almost similar things within, you know, a, a Jewish community too. Like we can be very destructive. Um, if you look at Israel, you know, we just have this very like delicate balance here. We are such a tiny part of the population. Like, let's find a way to hold it together. And, and I can speak for myself as somebody that was extremely anti and still is. I'm an anti-fundamentalist right wing and anti super hardcore orthodox. But, you know, if I meet somebody who is in the orthodox right wing, maybe homophobic space, I will try to do my best to communicate and be a mm -hmm. fellow Jew with them and say, well, actually I am a Jew and you might not think so, but you know, we can find our space together because I do think we have to reconcile our differences somehow if we're gonna survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what you're really pointing to is this idea around building relationships and sort of building bridges and finding our commonality. And we know a lot of change happens in the world when we can connect with others and mm -hmm. we can, can build some some shared experience and just really leading into that um what gives you hope in this time what are things that give you hope in the world 
You know, I will say what gives me hope lately is that I've had many meetings with very powerful people in the entertainment industry who are on the right side of history. And I'm like very moved by that. I mean, I've met people who are like Jill Soloway. I had a meeting with Jill a week ago and just, you know, the fact that Jill is out there in this world bringing a trans Jewish angle to Amazon television, you know, and saying, let's like make space for this. I care about this. And, and that Jill made a hit show and that people have said, yes, we want to see this. And that Ryan Murphy has made Pose and that, you know, he put his name on my film and says, yeah, you know, gay porn isn't going to be a little siloed thing that belongs in Outfest. Let's discuss it in the mainstream and let's acknowledge our larger cultural ties to this space. And I've just been more and more really hopeful because I see a, a younger, newer generation, a fresher generation of people who are not uh, forcing a single type of um, perspective and not saying, let's just make these kinds of movies because it's all about the numbers. Um, they're actually saying, no, we know that we have an obligation and you know, let's make some young adult TV series that's going to be for that little queer kid in Nebraska that needs to know there's, there's a way, there's a way for you. You can be safe. You can find your voice. And, uh, you know, it's been really exciting to me just that I have this access to people in power in this most powerful medium, which is our, you know, actual communication form. And I, and that they're committed to bringing out stories. That gives me a lot of hope. You know, the Ava DuVernays of the world, um, they're really doing something that I do think is like the God's work, you know, quote unquote, because in order to get people to come together, you have to be aligned with things that we're watching. You know, we do have to watch TV shows together. Yeah, so. I am. Um... I, I love to hear that you're having all of these conversations with people who are creating the media that we are looking to, to see ourselves mm -hmm. represented. Um, and I also, um, I watched your interview with Jill Soloway and oh. was blown away by that on, on, um, on Instagram. Um, and then I got to interview them on my podcast. Oh, cool. um, and that was also just like so cool to have a conversation with another trans Jew to talk about. Totally. Just like, really, we just talked about like what it feels like to be trans and like mm. having that, being able to, and then to hear from them, like all of the, all of how personal it was to like create transparent and how mm. it's such an important tool for people like me to share with my family where it's not only their, exactly. their understanding like the trans piece, but it's coming from the Jewish angle that they already have the frame of reference for. Um, totally. And it's no, cool. I'm so glad to hear that because, and that's so cool that you interviewed Jill. I mean, I just feel like it's really the Jill Soloways of the world that are creating that future for us all. And no, she, Jill is my hero. You know, I think um, when Jill found me and I found Jill, we, we, I had, I had known of Jill, of course, but Jill hadn't known of me. And, you know, to get the recognition that from Jill that this film mattered to them was also really profound because one of the things I will say about Jill in particular that is unique, not having anything to do with her or the, sorry, them being in the space of pure Jewish trans, which of course they occupy in a beautiful way. Jill has this incredible just ethic about helping. I mean, really, like I've never seen it in my life, the kind of ethic to help others, to help younger people, to help people in the community and just, you know, the grant that Jill put together, the kind of community space that Jill surrounds themselves with is, is, a, is in and of itself outside of their work, um, a lesson for everyone in Hollywood. I would love to see more of that. And I think Jill is very vocal about being a community leader and, and that Transparent itself hired within the community. So I have many friends and um, colleagues, you know, that I've worked with even that are people who are basically indebted to Jill as like their first 
getting their first job because nobody would easily get them their first job. You know, it's a really big deal that Jill mentors in addition to just produces the content. And I find that to be like the height of menschlich kite. I agree. <laughs> we could we could end on the Jill Soloway is awesome note. <laughs> yeah, I think it's perfect. <laughs> Emily is going to move us to our closing segment. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> as those mentioned earlier, we are just going to do a very brief kind of like rapid fire, like silly question. Um, okay. And are you ready? Yeah. Cool. Um, so first question, what is your favorite food? Oh my God. I am so Jewish because I love pickles and I love all things that are yes. fed and pickled. <laughs> Kimchi. Yeah, I just, you yeah. Name it. I'm with you. I just made the pickled onions yesterday. Had to do awesome. it. Awesome. Um, what is one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self? Wow. God, my younger self. You know, uh, here's a little piece of advice for everybody. And of course my younger self included. And I used to get this message. I had a relative who lived to be 104 and it was so Whoa. simple. Yeah. And he was the coolest guy. He was like a Yoda. Like he really was. He lived through world war one and two. And he came to this country. He was like a shoemaker, Levi Steinberg, of course, beautiful, most loving, most open-minded, free thinking, but also humble, kind of just, just a perfect mensch of a Jewish man and very, very, very modest. And he lived in this little nursing home and he was sort of, I connected to be my marriage. I wasn't even that related to him. But anyways, I, I love visiting him in this nursing home and he would always tell me this one thing. And I would get off the phone with him. Even when I lived in New York, I would call him. He would say, Rachel, enjoy your life. And that was it. And he would always say that as his closing statement. And I, I remember when he, he died and I, it, it really resonated. Like, what does that mean? Enjoy your life. And like, how do I actually live by that? You know? Okay. Cause I would think back in my twenties was so difficult. I and mean, I really like had a horrible time in my twenties, my teens, so difficult. And what does that mean to enjoy your life? And I, you know, sometimes when I'm in a very dark place, I get that voice in my head because he was a very positive guy and I, it was just sort of a simple message and it would lead me to think, okay, why am I not enjoying my life right now? Fuck it. Do I really need to be on Instagram? These people are driving me insane. Okay. Putting it down. You know, it would be this kind of thing if I could say to myself, I'm not enjoying my life right now. Why? Because of this. Okay. So let's just not do that. And it really was a profound thing to think of you know, enjoy your life as your North Star, because on the one hand, it can seem very, uh, you know, like flippant, like, okay, well, I guess then I won't be participating in social action if all I'm trying to do is enjoy my life. But no, I think it's the opposite. You will participate in social action if you enjoy it, if you do what, if you make it enjoyable, I will engage in this project. I will do the things that I know I want to do. I have to just enjoy it. So I really found that to be my, my words of wisdom uh, for myself. Like, you know, just, just know that this is it. This is your one life and, and enjoy it. I might go by YOLO. YOLO. Wait, is, I have a tattoo of it. Okay. It's just like my, my everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really is. You know, we have to be reminded it's there's why, why are we freaking out? <laughs> you know, why, mm -hmm. why are you letting this person get to you? It's just yellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. I love what you guys are doing, by the way. It's really important. And I, I hope Keshet's um, audience reach goes wider than the Jewish community, but has a you know foundation there. I love when that can be possible. It's really awesome. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you. Thank cool. you so much again for being here. And for all of you for watching and for listening, um, and don't forget to visit us at www.keshetonline.org to check out resources, videos, and information about Keshet and to support our work towards full LGBTQ equality in Jewish life.